Ethiopia is a country situated in the Horn of Africa, and it's been in the news in the last few years because its president, Abiy Ahmed, actually won the Nobel Peace Prize for bringing to an end the two decades long conflict that it fought with its neighbor, Eritrea. However, he has also come under increased scrutiny after there were several mass protests, mass incarcerations of political opponents of his, and censorship of the internet and journalists, as well as a resurgence of the ethnic and tribal divisions between those in Ethiopia itself. Furthermore, this has led to open conflict, especially in the northern region of Tigray, a region which throughout Ethiopia's history has had a disproportionately large amount of power for the surface area that it contains. However, this new president, Abiy Ahmed, has gone to war with this region in the very north of the country in an attempt to counter this, even employing the old enemy of Eritrea, which sits directly to the north of Tigray, to invade from the north. This conflict has been going on for a while and has claimed many lives, and so in this video I want to ask, why is Ethiopia at war with its northern province? Let's take a first look at the history of Ethiopia as a country and then dive into why this conflict has erupted. Now, Ethiopia's history is incredibly old and actually some of the oldest human remains ever found have been found there, some of different hominids going back to before four million years ago. Several kingdoms rose and fell in the ancient period, although the most powerful would become the kingdom of Aksum, and actually Mani, who was a 3rd century AD scholar from Babylonia, listed it as one of the four most powerful nations on earth at the time, including China, Rome and Persia. This would develop into the Middle Ages into lots of small independent groups in different parts of what today is Ethiopia. The fact that Ethiopia was a Christian kingdom in Africa intrigued many Europeans who had heard stories about it, and so myths and legends of a kingdom of Prester John, a man in Africa who was of Christian European descent, spread to Europe and many attempts were made by those in Europe in the Middle Ages to find this mythical kingdom. Now while that wasn't quite the right story, what's interesting is that actually many Ethiopians also visited Europe during the Middle Ages. And if you want to find out more about this interesting history, my good friend and history channel Jabzi has a video on this very subject, which I will be linking in the description below, as well as in a card in the top right hand side of this video. The relatively centralized kingdom of Ethiopia that was united during the Middle Ages and inspired such stories in Europe was broken during a period called the Zemene Mesafint, which is the age of princes in which there were lots of small regional powers powers based on the Solomonic dynasty or who claimed to be from this dynasty fighting against one another, a little bit like the Sengoku Jidai in Japan in an earlier period. This is generally agreed to have come to an end in around 1855 when one of these small princedoms from Quarta became the major power and defeated the others. This led to the British sending envoys to the victor and attempted to seal an alliance between the British and the Ethiopians as the scramble for Africa was about to commence. The man who had won power for himself in Ethiopia was crowned as Theodros II, or Theodore II, to give the English version of the Ethiopian name. He was a very eccentric ruler and had united many of the disparate kingdoms into one, although he faced rebellions almost straight away when he became the ruler, both from those within his new kingdom, as well as being attacked from forces outside, like the armies of the Egyptians and the Ottoman Turks, who often sided with some of the Muslim factions within Ethiopia at the time, such as the Oromo from the Oroma region. However, his eccentricity and feeling of empowerment would be the end of him, as after he had written a letter to the sovereign of Great Britain at the time, Empress Victoria, and she didn't reply, he decided to seize the British consul in the Abyssinian capital at the time, and so the British embarked on what became known as the Magdala expedition to free them. There was a battle between their forces, and after Theodros heard that his forces had been soundly defeated by the British, he committed suicide. The next significant emperor of Ethiopia wouldn't come from the Amara region, that was the home of Theodros, and in fact he came from the Tigray region, which will be featured later in this video, and he pursued friendlier relations with the British and used that 
to get arms and ammunition of the most modern kind. And with this, he was able to, despite having a much smaller force, defeat Teodros' heir and become the emperor of Ethiopia from his power base in Tigray. His reign wouldn't be a straightforward one, however, as in 1874, the Egyptians evaded from the north. However, he was able to fight back successfully against them and crush them in battle in 1875, leading to the Egyptian retreat. He was then able to go on the offensive and invaded some of the land to the north from the Emirate of Herar. His successor, Menelik II, was equally successful at beating back the attempts to incorporate Ethiopia in the scramble for Africa. And in 1896, he successfully destroyed an Italian army that had attempted to invade Ethiopia in the first Italo Ethiopian war. However, he wasn't able to protect his people from a deadly famine, which came from 1888 to 1892 and killed around one third of the entire population of what was then Ethiopia. His successor in turn is Haile Selassie, although he is sometimes known as Ras Tafari, one of his titles, and this is of course where we get the modern term Rastafari from and I talk more about this connection and why this etymology exists in my video on Rastafarianism, should you want to watch that. But he's a very important figure for the history of Ethiopia, and his royal banner with the famous lion and the green, gold, and red color scheme is why these colors and the lion image are still so much associated with the Rastafari movement and with reggae music in general. And a fun way to learn about this period of Ethiopian history is to listen to some reggae songs that talk about it, such as Iron Lion Zion, which describes his attempts to counter the 1937 second Italian invasion of Ethiopia in the second Italo-Ethiopian war and despite the brave efforts of the Ethiopians going against a fully modern Italian army they were unable to defeat the Italians on their own and the Italians took over the country although a guerrilla struggle soon ensued and in 1941 as part of the second world war the British army from their holdings in Africa invaded the part of Ethiopia that had been taken over by the Italians and so kicked them out of the country. And in 1943, the last pockets of Italian resistance continuing in the Gondar region had been subdued and so Ethiopia became a British colonial possession. The war was a terrible period for Ethiopia and hundreds of thousands of civilians were killed by the Italians, often using methods that are completely illegal like poisonous gas or indiscriminate killing. However, the Italians did start to modernize the country, building around 900 kilometers of railroads and improving greatly the infrastructure in the country in the form of ordinary roads and public health. Furthermore, Haile Selassie wanted to continue this type of modernization brought about in Ethiopia to make it a foremost nation in Africa and to better withstand against other colonial power. In 1952, Ethiopia was federated with Eritrea, that was a region to the north, a situation which was less meant to last for 10 years when there should have been a referendum on Eritrean independence. The reason why these two regions were separate in the first place is because in 1882, the Italians had from local rulers bought Aseb Bay as a trading station in East Africa, and they had started to build Italian settlements there, and so this region had become distinct to Ethiopia as it had belonged to Italy as a colony. And as such, they had provided soldiers for the e Italian invasion of Ethiopia, so one can imagine that there was quite a lot of bad blood between the two. Now in 1941, when the British had taken control of those Italian possessions, they had also taken over Eritrea and they would hold on to it for another 10 years. But in 1952, it had become federated with Ethiopia with the idea that within a decade, they would have a referendum on their own independence or whether they wanted to join Ethiopia. However, this isn't what happened. And in 1962, just before this referendum was meant to happen, Haile Selassie ordered that the Ethiopian army invade. And this they did and Ethiopia incorporated Eritrea as its 14th province into the nation. Not all Eritreans were happy with this, and so in 1961, when some could see which way the wind was blowing, 
the ELF was formed, and this became the Eritrean Liberation Front, an underground movement that was meant to liberate Eritrea and bring about the independence that many in the country wanted to see. The rising cost for the Ethiopian Defence Forces to fight back against this rebel insurgency, as well as the fact that in 1973 there was a crash in oil prices, meant that Haile Selassie had become very unpopular in Ethiopia, and in 1974 the Derg, a communist movement led by a man called Mengitsu, had seized power in the country, and from 1976 to 1978, during a period known as the Red Terror, some half a million people were killed by the communists. In 1977, seeking an apparent weakness, Somalia to the south decided to invade Ethiopia in what became known as the Ogaden War. And while the Somalis first had the upper hand against the new communist regime, the Ethiopians called for support from Cuba, another important socialist power, as well as a few others who sent both advanced tanks and soldiers and swung the war in the favour of the Ethiopians. From 1983 to 1985, however, thanks to a policy of aggressive revolutionary land reform, around a million people died in a famine, and this led to widespread discontentment and the creation of several armed rebel groups against the government, one in the north, in the region of Tigray, in 1975 being founded as the TPLF, or the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front. And yes, this is a video on modern African politics, and this is the first of many, many acronyms. But this one is probably the most important to remember. So if you're going to remember one, remember TPLF, Tigrayan People's Liberation Front. They were soon joined by another group, the EPLF, which you'll never guess, was the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, who in 1988 had taken over from the previous E... was it EPF? I don't even know. The other group that was in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, and together with other rebel groups, they formed the EPRDF, and this stood for the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, who wanted to establish democracy in Ethiopia as opposed to the communist regime. And they took up arms and fought against the communist regime in a years-long guerrilla struggle against them. And by 1991, they had swung the balance of power in the rebels' favour. They entered Abis Abeba, they tore down the hammers and sickles, and established a democratic government. Now, in 1993, there were the first free and fair open elections in Eritrea, and Eritrea finally became an independent country following their victory against the communists. In Ethiopia, however, there were also elections, and in 1995, these occurred, and the first prime minister of this new democratic country was Meles Zenawi. However, the democracy was rather shallow. The nation was called the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, emphasis being on the federal democratic system, as really what this had been was this umbrella group of rebels, the EPRDF, which had come together to form the government. And so what the government was made up of was all of these various, again, acronyms of the different regional militias that had fought against the communists having the power. And the group that was most powerful within this umbrella coalition of rebel groups and then the government that was formed from these groups was of course the TPLF from Tigray. And needless to say that Zenawi, the first prime minister, was himself from Tigray and an important member of the TPLF. One of the things that he did was that in 1998 he went to war with his former allies in the north, that being Eritrea. And after many years of war, they finally were still at war in 2016, where because of this system of government where the TPLF were basically calling the shots despite only being a region in the north and so there wasn't a representative democracy, there were mass protests in 2016 about this form of government, but this was cracked down hard upon by the government and around Addis Ababa, the capital and other places, around 500 people were killed. Before diving right into the real crux of why there is currently a war happening in Tigray, I'd quickly like to give you a word about today's video sponsor, which is Ground News. With this video, I had to look at a lot of different newspaper articles and reporting that were talking about the Tigray war. 
And the problem a lot of the time when you're clicking on these articles is that they use cookies and these cookies will tell you are you looking at a left wing source or are you looking at a right wing source and if you happen to click on a left wing source you're only going to get those recommended whereas sometimes it's good to diversify and to look at other opinions who might be reporting on different things or from a slightly different angle. And this is where I would like to recommend Ground News because Ground News actually tells you on the reporting that happens. One thing that I really like about Ground News is that like with this, you can actually see how few of the Western media outlets are reporting on Tigray at the minute. And you can also see on whether more of the left-wing press or the right-wing press are reporting on it and then select from various of these political orientations to get a more rounded view on this topic and to avoid avoid entering that terrible echo chamber of opinion that many people seem to be falling prey. You can find Ground News by going to ground.news slash Hilbert or going to the description below and following the link to download the free app. It's really worth your while and I think it's a really helpful tool for trying to understand not only what's going on in the world today but also how it's being perceived from different viewpoints. In 2018 the head of the EPRDF became a man called Abi Ahmed and as he was the head of the EP RDF, he also became the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. This was an important moment because he was from the ODP, which is the Oromo Democratic Party, something that was unheard of because until that point, every single leader of the EPRDF and of Ethiopia had been from the TPLF. And so suddenly with his election, the TPLF went from basically calling the shots in all of Ethiopia as the head of this umbrella organization to being relegated just to the region of Tigray, where they were of course in the majority. In Tigray, they continued to act very autonomously and refused to hand over a man who had been charged to the central police of Ethiopia under Abiy Ahmed. And so tension started to mount between the rest of Ethiopia that was no longer under the sway of the TPLF as part of the EPRDF umbrella and the Tigray region, which was controlled by the TPLF. These tensions would come to a head in 2019 when Ahmed would decide to dissolve the EPRDF DF and instead create a new party umbrella group called the PP, which is short for the Prosperity Party. And not wanting to belong to an organization with such a silly acronym, the TPLF decided not to join this group, whereas all the other major parties in the country that had come from these rebel groups had joined this movement. And so the crisis between the Tigray region being led by the TPLF and the rest of the country deepened. This really came to a head in 2020 when, due to the coronavirus, the elections in the Tigray region had to be postponed. And when they were held, the president, Ahmed, decided not to acknowledge the result of these elections. However, at the same time, he says that they were held without proper supervision and so couldn't be counted as legitimate. The situation worsened as the Ethiopian prime minister allied with the Eritreans who they had fought a war against for many years and they started to line up troops on the border. An important player here is the province of Amhara, which is just to the south of Tigray and which has many independent militias. And something to know about Ethiopia is that while there is the national army, which I'll touch on in just a second, all of these different ethnic groups also have their own militias and grievances against one another, something which has been bubbling up in the country and was part of the decision why President Ahmed decided to do away with the umbrella EPRDF movement to try and move away from ethnic tensions, but this in itself caused there to be large ethnic unrest between these groups. This buildup of troops along the border with the Tigray region did nothing to solve the conflict. When a general from central Ethiopia was sent to take over the responsibility of armed forces in Tigray, he was turned back by those militants loyal to the TPLF and there was seemed that there would definitely be a conflict between the TPLF and the Ethiopian government as the former seems to be portraying itself as an independent state rather than accepting the commands of the central government 
government in Addis Ababa. And in October 2020, things went much worse than this. And going into November, the 2nd of November, it was told to journalists who were asking the uh, command forces of the Ethiopian ENDF, which is the Ethiopian National Defense Force, they said they were preparing to launch an attack into Tigray to bring it back to heel. What happened instead, however, was that two days later, on the 4th of November 2020, the TPLF struck first, and they attacked several of the command positions of the ENDF along the border that they had prepared for their invasion and drove them back. And this is the first of the conflicts that would come to characterize the Tigray War. And following this event, there was all-out war in the province of Tigray, and it followed that the Ethiopian armed forces, as well as these militias, in the province of Amhara and indeed soldiers to the north across the Ethiopian border in independent Eritrea streamed into Tigray and the conflict started in earnest. The rest of November saw brutal fighting between these forces and the forces loyal to the TPLF in Tigray. The war is being characterized by the shelling of cities to capture them and by the indiscriminate killing a lot of the time of civilians. This seems to be happening from what I have at least seen more on the side of the Ethiopian army and the Eritreans and Amharans that they are killing civilians in Tigray. This partially is because of the ethnic tension that I mentioned before and in some part because the TPLF and Tigray in general had for so long dominated Ethiopia and committed atrocities against the other ethnic groups in the country that some see this as now their way to strike back at them but it's really turned into a disgusting war of killing one another based on race and ethnicity in the state while these armed forces and paramilitary groups are moving around. Now on the 28th of November 2020, the capital city of Tigray, Mekele, was taken by ENDF soldiers. However, the TPLF refused to be defeated and continued to wage a guerrilla campaign against them, moving into the hills and mountainous regions to strike back at them. They also reformed under the new acronym of TDF, which is the Tigrayan Defense Force, and slowly started to make gains against the enemy now that they were not in any more fighting in a conventional style. So by February 2021, it was estimated that around 40% of Tigray was not under the control of the ENDF this figure being squeezed by both the resurgent TDF as well as by the Eritreans who remember are not fighting in their own country they have crossed over the border into this Ethiopian region and are there pursuing their own aims to enrich themselves as well as to in some ways get revenge against the Tigrayans. The war would turn again on the 22nd of June 2021 as an Ethiopian army cargo plane full of supplies was shot down this buoyed rebel morale and within just six Six days on the 28th of June, they victoriously stormed the capital that had been taken way back in November and proclaimed that they were back in control of this capital city before removing enemy forces from Tigray altogether. They pushed the Eritreans back over the border, they managed to ambush many of the Amhara militia, and the Ethiopian army were in retreat towards the end of June of 2021, the year that I'm recording this. Now, they pushed them out of Tigray, and then the Tigrayan defense forces themselves went on to the offensive in the neighboring province of Afar, as well as Amhara, where many of these militias were present. And on the 4th of August 2021, because they were making gains, a region of Amhara called Agao actually created a new movement, another acronym called ALF, which was the Agao Liberation Front that declared itself independent from Amhara and sided with the forces of Tigray against the federal government. Now on the 11th of August 2021, from the region of Oromia, which is another province, actually another organization, three-letter acronym, was founded, which was called the OLA. This is the Oromo Liberation Army, and they too joined forces with the forces in Tigray and from the Agao region, and they have said that they are forming a grand coalition of rebel movements against the capital. And I'm not one to make predictions for the future, but I don't give it particularly long because if we've looked at all of this Ethiopian history before, you can see that when these rebel groups start to join together against a central government, the central government never normally seems to last long. 
and the influence of Tigray after all these years is still being felt. But right now, that is how it stands in Ethiopia. The country is on the brink of large-scale civil war, and the conflict that was once confined to Tigray has now flipped and has spilled over into the neighboring provinces, as well even as into some of the neighboring countries like Sudan and a little into Somalia. But if you're interested in that, let me know, and I can revisit this topic when I have more information on the subject and potentially to look at a different angle. But in this one, I wanted to present the history of Ethiopia as a whole, so potentially you can analyze some trends and uh, occurrences that have happened more often in Ethiopian history, like the importance of Tigray and how powerful and commanding its position in the north of the country is, as well as some of the more recent trends that we've seen in Ethiopian history. But for now, I'm going to end the video there. I do hope that you've enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed looking at this topic, um, not because it's a particularly cheerful topic, and I wish the people of Ethiopia all the best and hope that a peaceful solution can be reached, but because it's something I didn't know too much about and that a lot of people have asked me in the comments below to cover the conflict in Tigray as I've been looking at some more of the modern history recently. Check out in the description below a link to Jabzi's video on medieval Ethiopia, which I think will be very interesting. And do check out Ground News as well, because they make it a lot easier for me to research these topics by bringing the news under a finer microscope to analyze their own biases. But for now, this has been the rather recent history, and I have been Hilbert.